You hear a knock at the door. You walk over, open it, and there, standing on your front step, is a dog in a hat. Now stop. I want you to really think, what do you see? Leave a comment if you want. If everyone commented what they saw, the diversity would be astounding. We'd have corgis and top hats, labs and snapbacks, bulldogs and bowler hats. Some people would see the dog on four legs, others would see it standing up like a person. It's weird when you think about it. Everyone watching knows what a dog is, knows what a hat is, is hearing the same phrase, yet we're all picturing different things. That's kind of cute and fun with a little exercise like this, but it can be a massive source of confusion and conflict when we're talking about money. It's no secret that money can strain relationships. In some cases, it even ends them. And it's also no surprise. Money touches just about every area of our lives, particularly when we think about what we want our life to look like. But how do we do a better job of communicating with each other, especially our partners, when it comes to money? I'm Ben with YNAB, and today we're talking about how to have better conversations about money. Let's start by looking at how this communication thing actually works. For this video, I'll be using a version of what's called the Shannon Weaver model of communication. And it goes a little something like this. The first step in any intentional communication is an idea. You have something in your head that you wanna get into someone else's head. Since we don't have the technology to beam ideas directly into other people's heads yet, you have to turn that idea into something you can transfer to the other person. So you encode your non-transferable idea into transferable words. Those words are called a message. That message then has to travel to the other person through a channel. That could be the air between you and the other person, or in this case, between you and me, it's YouTube and your speaker. As the message travels along the channel, it's likely to encounter noise, something that interferes with or distorts your message. Maybe a dog starts barking as you speak. Maybe he's wearing a top hat. Maybe the other person is preoccupied with something else, or maybe your speaker volume isn't quite loud enough. Once the message reaches the receiver, they have to take that message and any noise that comes with it and decode those words back into an idea, hopefully the one you wanted them to receive. Simple, right? But if you've ever communicated with, well, anyone, you know it's a lot harder than it sounds. So where do things go wrong? A lot of our miscommunication can be chalked up to problems with encoding and decoding. If I started encoding my ideas into Elvish during this video, most of you wouldn't be able to decode it, but some of you could. But most of us aren't speaking different languages than our partner, so what's going on there? Well, what do you think of when I say the word winter? Maybe your mind fills with happy thoughts, hot chocolate, pretty snowflakes, fuzzy sweaters, or maybe your mind fills with icy roads, holiday debt, and freezing temperatures. See, our brains don't operate like dictionaries. They're more like encyclopedias. When I say the word winter, your mind fills with associations, with other ideas, experiences, and feelings. We all basically know what winter is, but we don't stop there. And what comes to mind is going to be hugely dependent on how we were raised, what kind of culture we grew up in, our personal experiences, and how we felt about all of those things. Take the word debt, for instance. What does that word make you feel? You might feel anxious about whether you've taken on too much. You might feel guilty about having any at all. You might feel liberated because you got out of debt and are determined to never go back. You might feel angry because you feel like you or people you love have been preyed upon by debt companies. Or you might feel neutral. Maybe you've never had debt. Or maybe you view debt as a somewhat risky tool that you can leverage when it's strategic to do so. Now, whatever you feel, think about it. Where does that feeling come from? What have your experiences with debt been? What about your families? What is the normal attitude about debt amongst people around you? What have you been taught about debt, explicitly or implicitly? You're starting to explore your encyclopedia around debt. And it's probably a bit complex. There's a lot of stuff mixed in there. Some of it financial, some of it not. Meanwhile, your partner has their own unique encyclopedia regarding debt. And there's a good chance it's not only complex like yours, but also different than yours. Maybe in little ways, maybe in big ways. If you and your partner don't know that, if you just assume you're both operating out of the same encyclopedia, then you're likely to make inaccurate assumptions when you're encoding and decoding each other's language around debt. Let's use an example. 
Let's say my wife Maddie is looking through our budget and she sees I made a purchase at Target. She's not sure what it's for, so she asks me, why did you spend this much at Target? She might be encoding a simple request for information. She just wants to categorize that money correctly. But I might be hearing an accusation, or I might feel scolded, or I might hear something way more dramatic. And what I'm hearing probably depends on my encyclopedia around spending. But of course, she might really be trying to communicate more than that. Maybe she is upset or wants me to change my behavior. And she's trying to signal that through this question. If we don't take the time to clarify what we're really talking about in a way that both of us can clearly understand, then this could easily cause us to spiral into an argument or to nurse private resentment. So how do we work on that? Well, first, we need to explore each other's encyclopedias. We need to take some time to sit down and talk about our experiences, ideas, and feelings around money. We're going to need to ask some deep questions. It's important to remember that this is not about editing each other's encyclopedias. It's about learning them. You can't begin to get on the same page if you don't know what's already been written down. So focus on listening and asking questions and hold back on judging or correcting. If something they say does bother you, get curious about that. Why are you having that reaction? What are they saying and what are you hearing? A professional counselor can be a really great help here. What you learn from these conversations can help you talk about money with more care and awareness. You can be more conscientious about the language you use or how you approach certain topics or situations so that you're more likely to understand each other and move forward together. And when you do hit a bump in the road, you can ask for clarity. When you said this, I heard this. Is that what you meant? Or when I said this, I meant this. Is that what you heard? These kinds of conversations are opportunities to move toward each other rather than against or away from each other. So encoding and decoding can be a major issue, but noise is no joke either. Remember, noise is that stuff that interferes with or distorts the message. A lot of us experience noise with money because we don't quite know what our money is doing. If our bank balance drops more than usual, does that mean we're in trouble? Are we overspending? Do we need to change something? What's an acceptable drop and what's a concerning one? And what are we supposed to do about it? And then you get these weird, vague statements like, I think we should save more toward retirement that kind of cast this weird shadow of scarcity over your spending. Like you think you should be saving more, but you're not sure where that money is supposed to come from. So it just kind of feels like you need to tighten up all of your spending or at least feel a little bit guilty when you do inevitably spend. You can tune out so much of this noise by giving every dollar a job. Rather than saying, I think we should be saving more for retirement. You can say, right now we're putting this much towards retirement and this much towards everything else. Do we want to change that? And by how much? Because all your dollars have jobs, you're forced to determine what specific trade-off you want to make in order to save more for retirement. That can feel stressful in the moment, but it actually lifts that shadow of scarcity off your other spending. If that money is coming from your hobby or fitness category, then you don't need to worry about tweaking your grocery spending or going to fewer restaurants. You've cut out the noise. Honestly, that's probably one of the reasons people shy away from budgets. There's very little fuzziness to hide behind. Numbers are concrete and unambiguous. So you have to be honest and transparent about what really matters to you. And so does your partner. And that can be hard. But having that unambiguous noise-free plan can give you some stable, common ground when you're trying to build your life together. So why not set up a little money date with your partner? Pop open a bottle of wine and crack open those encyclopedias and start getting on the same page about money. If you need a little help getting started, you can check out our written guide on managing money with a partner, or you can download our handy money date printout, both available in the description below. And that's it for me. As always, thank you for watching, and remember, Money can't buy you love, but the way you manage the money you have together is a way that you can love the person you do love to together with your money. Okay, bye.